Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the first installment of the 2023 season of the History Speaker Series. We're very happy to have you all with us this evening. Um, so I have a few people to thank before we launch into the program this evening. First off, I want to thank Marianne Grant and the OMA History Committee for making this event entirely possible. Without them, it would not be so. I want to thank Monica for making the poster for this evening. And I'd like to thank Deanne from Rogers TV as well, who has been lovely enough to partner with us and uh, help us grow our audience. So you can see some of our programs on uh, Rogers TV. You may have already, and you'll be able to see this one at a later date as well. So um, I'll introduce you to everybody who's on screen. Firstly, we have Monica, who is the operations coordinator at OMA. I'm sure many of you have met her already. We have Trish as well, who is the head of the history committee at OMA. My name is Lindsay. I'm the history coordinator at the Aurelia Museum of Art and History. And then, of course, we have uh, a very special person joining us this evening. Um, with us today, we have Dave Town, who many of you, I think, will be familiar with already, especially if you are a history speaker series regular. Dave has an incredible passion for our local history, and he has penned several fascinating books about the history of our area. And these are such an important record for our own history, locally on sports and um, our local culture. The latest book is about the Black Swamp Gang, which is the subject of the talk this evening. And this and several other books are available at OMA. Um, this will be Dave's seventh presentation as a guest speaker for OMA, and it's our goal to have him back every year, if he'll allow it. <laughs> um, before uh, I turn things over to Dave, um, please be aware if you do have any questions, we will be having a question and answer period at the end of the presentation today. So hold on to your questions, write them down if you have to, and then at the time being, put them in the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will read as many of them as possible to Dave so that he can answer them for us. Um, so that is all for me. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dave for his fascinating presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, here I am again speaking. I love to talk about all the history I write about. I got to get this to sit down. Stop there. Um, this has been a really fun project. It was a long project. This was really hard to research because I didn't run into a single person who had um, even heard of the Black Swamp Gang. So there's there were no interviews or anything to do. And it's all bits and pieces of information drawn from all kinds of different sources and trying to put the story together. So it, it turns out to be a pretty interesting story. So let me let me start back in Aurelia in the 1870s. There were two defining features that uh, that described Aurelia back then. The first was, it was a boom town. It was booming with business because it was the supply center for the uh, lumber industry. Um, so the uh, the lumber companies would get supplies brought in, brought into Aurelia and they'd come here and pick them up. But likewise, the men would come in here for the recreation. Um, and then when the railways came through in 1871 and 1873, Aurelia became the supply center for all the railway construction workers and, and the supply depot for them. So there was endless business opportunities catering to all these men who were coming into town and the local businessmen took a real advantage of that. They, were, they wisely in, reinvested their, their profits into expanding business and starting new businesses. And uh, there was rapid growth um, through the 1870s. But at the same time, there was another defining feature of Aurelia, and that was the 1870s was Aurelia's wild times. You have all these sturdy, um, strong men with money in their pockets coming to town. They were looking for three things. They were looking for booze, brothels, and brawls. And they found all of those uh, in, uh, in great supply in Aurelia. Um, in 1870, um, the the town council experimented in trying to foster this business environment um, by re reducing any restrictions on granting licenses to taverns in town. And so suddenly in 1870, 71, there were 29 taverns 
in a town of barely a thousand people. They quickly realized this was a disaster because violence and brawling um, exploded in the town and the locals and the businessmen were appalled at the, at the violence that appeared. So they started bringing restrictions in on tavern licenses. So in 1872, there was only 16 licenses, and the next year there was only seven licenses. In 1874, there was only seven licensed uh, taverns in Aurelia. But what that did is it concentrated all the rowdy men into seven places. So we can go to the next slide. The brawling up and down the main street of Aurelio got out of hand. There would be brawls of up to 100, 100 men at once out in the streets. And those were the fights between the shanty men and the railway navvies, particularly. Um, but Aurelio was a small town defined by booming business and wild times. It was the same out in the country. Um, you can flip to the next slide. It was same out in the, in the country. We, we think of the pioneer farmers, you know, who arrived here in the 1830s and 40s um, as being hard scrabble, uh, full of industry and hard work, working communally with barn raisings and, and you know, sort of leaning on each other in a real sense of community. But at the same time, there was a real problem with drunkenness out in the country. Every, about every four miles along all the country roads, there were taverns. They were, they were there for travelers, so they were a place they could get a meal and they could have a bed for the night, and there was always a tavern. Um, so scattered across North Simcoe County um, were you know, dozens of taverns all around. And that became too big of a, um, an attraction for local farmers. And there were farmers and farmers' sons who got into a lot of trouble because they they couldn't uh, they couldn't keep away from the alcohol. So this farm, as you can see in the picture here, is on the outskirts of Aurelia. But the farms by the 1870s, you know, had been a, a full generation of farming. They were pretty substantial. They they were generally successful. Um, the nice frame houses and good fences and all of that. But there were um, a lot of of the farmers and the younger sons who would be heading out to the taverns on too much of a regular basis. So crime in, in rural areas, if you listen to the government and you listen to the uh, police, crime wasn't a problem because everyone relied on everyone else. But modern research has shown that crime was intermittent in rural areas. It, it cropped up in areas and there'd be a spree of crime and then it would be calm for a while. The Black Swamp Gang is uh, an example of how that happened. So that's what we're going to talk to tonight about how the rural areas in North Simcoe County became victims of violence and then terrorism um, of this rural crime. So if we go to the next slide. So the, the driving force behind, behind this was a man named Sandy McDuff. And this is the only picture I could find of him. This is a newspaper picture from 1880. Um, he came from a farm family at Jarrett's Corners, about 12 kilometers from Aurelia. Um, this is a map I got out of Mary Garbett's great book. Um, of, this is the size of Jarrett's Corners. It was just a crossroads. Um, but Sandy McDuff's father came and, and took up a, a, a grant of land um, in 1832, started farming. He was one of the lucky Highland Scots from the island of Isla who, who got um, fertile land. So he, he did pretty well. A lot of the other Highland Scots gave up after a few years and moved on to, to better land because uh, North Simcoe County, there's a lot of moraine, there's a lot of gravel and a lot of farms didn't do very well. But uh, John McDuff was lucky. His, he got good land. He became the most successful farmer in the region. He owned the first cow in the region. He eventually got this fine team of horses that everyone envied. Um, he bought a second 200 acre plot of land, so his farm was now 300 acres, um, and he was doing very well. Um, he had seven children. The first two, Archie and John, um, were there right at the very beginning in 1832. They didn't have any children for five years as they homesteaded, but then they had a string of girls. They had four girls in a row starting in 1838, and then three years after the last girl, they finally got a third son. And this was Alexander, who was known as Sandy McDuff. Now, Sandy's oldest brother was the, uh, the farmhand. He's the one who helped his father run the farm. The second boy, John, was a bit of a layabout. He was a, he was a barroom brawler. He was one of the younger sons who would, who would head out into the taverns. When Sandy came along 15 years after John, 
Um, by the time he grew up into his teenage years, um, he could have followed in Arch Archie's footsteps and become a good, good sturdy farmer, but he chose to be mentored by his brother, John, and John taught Sandy the tavern life, and Sandy took to it with a vengeance. The reason being, Sandy was six foot four, he was athletic, he was very quick, he was remarkably strong. There's all kinds of stories about his strength. When he would venture into these taverns and, and get into the, the uh, rough housing with the, with the sawmill men and the railway navvies, um, he found a, a place he was very comfortable and he took to brawling and he quite quickly developed a reputation as the best brawler in North Simcoe County. No one could beat him. There's only a record of him ever losing one fight, and that was probably because he was too drunk or got taken advantage of because the paper said he was beaten by a lesser man. But he beat all the champion brawlers in all the bars all around North Simcoe County. The big, strong, husky lumbermen were no match for Sandy McDuff. He was, he was too good. So he, he developed this reputation as, as being the toughest. But at the same time, he developed a reputation as being the meanest. It was well known across the, the north end of the county that once Sandy got into the beer and the whiskey, um, you were best just to get out of his way because when he got into a fight, he was gonna win, but he wasn't happy with just winning. Once he won, he wanted to dominate you and then he had to humiliate you. And there are stories of, of um, him pulling out his guns at the, after he had beaten the man up and then forcing him to dance at, at, uh, with firing shots at his feet, like you hear in the old Westerns out, uh, on the movies. Um, there are stories of him um, forcing men to crawl out the doors on their hands and knees. You weren't allowed to walk away. You had to humiliate yourself. There are stories of him picking up two men, one under each arm, and carrying them out and throwing them into the manure pile. Um, he wasn't going to just win. He had to win and then he had to humiliate you. And he became a terror in the bars for this reason. No one could stand up to him. Um, no one could beat him. And then he, he just embarrassed people by too much. And you can imagine, it's still, still the same today. Strong men like that attract crowds to them. Other, other men of the same ilk gathered around him, reveling in, in his superiority and the security it comes in being in this group. And so Sandy would start showing up at, at, at the taverns around the area. He'd always have a group of people with him, all these lackeys, and they were, weren't shy about brawling as well. They became known as the, the, the boys from Oro. And uh, when the boys from Oro entered into the bar, you knew there was gonna be trouble once the, once the whiskey got flowing. This group of lackeys and sycophants evolved into the Black Swamp Gang. Initially, they were just brawlers. They, they were just out to make trouble. Um, but eventually, they started getting into petty crime. And there's a reason for that. In 1873, there was a huge economic crash across North America and across Europe. Um, before the Great Depression in 1930s, if you mentioned the Great Depression, everybody thought 1873, the Great Depression of 1873. The, the banks overextended themselves. There was runaway inflation. Um, businesses all across North America went bankrupt. Canada was uh, affected particular, particularly hard. Um, and so times were tough. And this affected the farmers in North Simcoe County because the farmers relied on credit to, to do their business. They had to, they had to borrow money to buy seed, to buy new equipment, um, to buy livestock. If, uh, if they didn't have credit, um, their farms could go under. Well, once the depression hit in 1873, there, there wasn't a lot of money to be had. And if you didn't have a, a, um, a good credibility in, in being able to pay back this, this debt, the bank wouldn't loan you the money. And there were farmers who really suffered after, after 1873. And for this reason, there started to, to be this uh, spree of crime across North Simcoe County. Sandy McDuff and his gang initially started with just very petty crime. Um, and it seems like they were just trying to raise enough money that they could go brawl, brawling in the taverns. Sandy was loose with his money. He liked to buy around for the boys. He loved to make bodacious bets. Um, he threw his money around easily in one hand and out the other. He needed a steady flow of cash. Well, farmers don't have a steady full flow of cash. Sandy would go and work in the lumber camps for, to, to make more money, but he spent far more than he made. 
And so it's clear he turned to, to petty crime to raise this money. And it's, it seems like the men who gathered around him were quite comfortable joining him in this. And they became quite sophisticated in how they perpetrated this crime. So what they did is they were robbing their neighbors. They were robbing farms all around North Simcoe County from, from Barrie to Aurelia to Washago to Midlands um, over towards Collingwood. Anywhere in that whole catchment area, um, they were likely to show up. And for that reason, it was very important that they were secretive. If, if someone was recognized, the odds are um, they would they would get caught by the police because they knew who they were. If someone someone saw you, they were going to recognize you. So everything had to be done in complete secrecy. Hence, they became known for raiding farms when people were not home. So they would keep an eye open. And uh, on a Sunday when you're at church, on a holiday fair day, um, on an election day when people are off voting, that's when your farm would get raided where there'd be no one around to see them. But even more, they took to late night raids. Three o'clock in the morning, they'd show up at your farm. Sometimes it would just be three men who'd come in to, to uh, grab what they could. But often there would be 15 men would show up with three wagons and they would clean a barn out. To do this kind of, this kind of thievery, they had to do a lot of scouting. And then they had to get together and discuss um, what a target was going to be, what was the best way to approach them when they could get there. And so they had to have meetings. Initially, the meetings were held in the taverns before they got drunk. But after a while, um, they, uh, they were, there were too many of them, it was too high profile. They had to find a secret place. And the secret place that Sandy McDuff came up with was the Black Swamp. So we'll go to the next slide. The Black Swamp was a an area of the uh, drainage of the headwaters of the Coldwater River. So you can see on the, the, the map on the right, um, the Black Swamp is about twice the size of Bass Lake. It was four kilometers across in each direction. Um, you can see all the rivers and tributaries that ran through it. There were three sawmills in there um, where they would back the water up, but it was low and marshy and swampy there was a, a, a whole network of trails running all through there that were created by hunters and trappers. Um, and Stanley McDuff and his gang got to know those trails. So a lot of the trails um, ended up uh, uh, going into a river and being stopped. They would get very, very narrow and go through thick thickets. Um, only a few trails would give you a direct route out in, in any direction. They got to know those trails very well. Few other people knew where all these trails went. But this became their headquarters. They had a clearing. They would go in near Colson, near Langman's Mill. Um, and uh, it couldn't have been you know, more than half a kilometer or three quarters of a kilometer in. They would have a clearing. And that's where they had held their meetings. And that's where they transferred for their goods. There, they became very sophisticated in their, their thievery in how you get rid of the stolen goods. They would raid a farm and they would steal livestock, cows and pigs and chickens. They clean out a chicken roost. Um, they would raid a root cellar, clean out a root cellar. They would take your clothes off the clothesline or quilts off the clothesline. Um, rarely would they go into the house looking for money or any valuables in there. It was always out in the barns. But the goal, the, the big prize was always stealing a horse. The horse is like the tractor in today's farms. You couldn't run a farm without your horse. You, you needed the horse to plow the fields. You needed your horse to get you to town to get supplies. The horse is what was valuable. And that's what they, that was the, the big goal. But they would, they would show up late at night with 15 men and three wagons. And they'd go to the cows in the field over, over the hill from the house. And instead of hauling the cow away, who would only saunter so fast, you couldn't get it away very well. They just butcher the cow in the field, grab the side of beef and hightail it with that. They'd fill their wagon with, with meat from, from uh, slaughter out there. And then the farmer would find the dead carcasses in the morning. But then they had to sell this stuff. And they were very good at creating alibis for each other. And this is the way they operated. Um, a few men would go and do the robbery, steal whatever they could steal. They'd hightail it as fast as they could. And they'd head into the Black Swamp or some other meeting place where they'd meet some cohorts. They'd transfer the goods to their cohorts 
who would race off to another community. They'd go off to Bracebridge or Midland or Barrie or Newmarket. Um, and first thing in the morning, they would quickly sell it before anyone knew it was stolen. Meanwhile, the men who did the stealing would head back to their farms. And so the, when the farmer woke up and realized he had been robbed and he would suspect, suspect that no good youngest son of the neighbor's farm, he'd look over and at eight o'clock in the morning, there that guy would be out uh, um, plowing his field or fixing his fence. Like he, he couldn't have stole the guy's horse because there he was, he didn't have a horse in his farm. They had no idea there was a gang and could not even conceive of the organization of the robberies that they would transfer it off and someone else would ride off and sell it, you know, 40 kilometers away in, in another town. And for this reason, they never got caught. But there was even a bigger reason why they never got caught. The Black Swamp Gang wasn't just about robbery and thievery. They were about terror. If a farmer had the temerity to report a robbery to the police, um, he would be a victim of terrorism. He would find um, his dog would be shot or his fences had been pulled down or worst of the worst was his barn would be burned. If you challenged the Black Swamp Gang, if you threatened them with the police, they retaliated with terror. And by 1877, all of North Simcoe County lived in fear of the Black Swamp Gang. They, um, they learned that petty theft was just a part of farm life and it wasn't worth reporting them. And for that reason, for 10 years, the Black Swamp Gang got away with this kind of, with this kind of robbery. And so that leads to the question, what about the policing? Why wouldn't they phone the police? Why didn't the police hunt them down? And it's a good question. So there were, there were two police forces. One, each community, like Aurelia and Barry, had their own police force. Well, in Aurelia, it was four men. They were volunteers. Their mandate was to keep the peace in Aurelia. They had their hands full with the brawling and the fighting and the petty theft in Aurelia. They didn't have time or the energy to ride all the way out to Hillsdale and, and talk to the farmer who had his cow butchered. Um, the local police, that just was not what they were going to do. So the, the province started a system of county constables. So there was one chief county constable for all of Simcoe County by the name of Joseph Rogers out of Barrie. It was his job to keep the peace in Simcoe County. And you know how big Simcoe County is. You know, 60 miles north, 60 miles south from Barrie. So if a farmer had his team of horse, horses stolen, you know, making his, his ability to farm impossible, he'd have no choice but to, to take a day, get down to Barrie, report it to, uh, to the county constable. They rarely did that because rarely did they get satisfaction from the constable. He was unpaid. It was a volunteer position. Hence, he had to hold down a whole lot of other petitions, positions to make his money. A day away from all those other jobs was money he wasn't making. If, if you didn't show up as a farmer with a good lead as to where you're going to find these horses or who did it, uh, he, he wasn't inclined to go and investigate. And the farmer soon learned it wasn't even worth reporting it. So by 1877, there were, there were three warrants out for Sandy McDuff's arrest for various things, mostly for assault and battery. Um, the police never confronted him. He'd come to town, he'd get into brawls, the police would show up and they'd conveniently let Sandy slip out of town and get away. The papers several times put articles in saying, accusing the police of they were afraid of Sandy McDuff. And, you know, Constable Moffat were for one that said, I'm ready to arrest him anytime, but he never did. They they specifically avoided the places where Sandy McDuff went because they were afraid to confront him. Um, and so that's the situation we were in in 1873. Terrorized farmers, um, organized robbery on a scale no one could comprehend, and the police forces afraid to confront the leader of the gang, not to mention the members of his gang. In 1877, um, Sandy McDuff and his gang um, spent most of the time when they came to Aurelia in, in one particular tavern. So we can go to the next slide. 
Um, the Black Swamp Gang inhabited the Russell House Tavern, which is a great tavern on the outskirts of town, huge tavern. Um, it was convenient for them because it was the first tavern you come into as you come to Aurelia and was also the farthest away from the town where the, the police uh, would, were likely to make arrests. So they were safer from the police out there. At the same time, the Reagan boys from Mara, um, who came to town and got into a lot of brawling as well, they uh, inhabited the American Hotel and the Albany Hotel mostly. The Black Swamp Gang were, um, were uh, Highland Scots, they were Orange men, they were Protestants. The Reagan boys were Catholics from Ireland. There's enough reason right there for brawling. And whenever the two gangs ventured into the other gang's territory, that's when the big brawls start. It wasn't the big brawls of 100 guys out in the street like you get with the railway navvies. This, when, when these two, two gangs met and the brawl started, the locals and the, the lumbermen, they knew just to get out of the way. And the brawl would be a three on three and a four on four. Often it was just a champion on each side fighting it out for the respect of, the, of, of their friends. Um, and there were some heroic fights between, between these two gangs, but they all had their own places that they took as their own turf. Now, it all came to, to an end in uh, the May long weekend of 1877, May 25th weekend, the, the Queen Victoria's birthday. Um, Sandy McDuff and two of his Black Swamp Gang men had uh, gone into the tavern in Price's Corners, uh, Archibald Derrick's tavern. Tavern. They got into confrontations with with uh, with the uh, the owners and with the the poor young twenty year old bartender. Sandy had pulled out his gun. He had held it against the bartender's chest um, when he was refused uh, whiskey. And then he pointed the gun at, at Dara. Then he pointed the gun at Dara's wife, threatening to kill them. Um, after this, um, Dara had had enough. And at the first opportunity, he slipped out of the bar, hopped on his horse and rode the eight miles into Aurelia um, to uh, swear out a warrant for Sandy McDuff's arrest for attempted murder. Um, normally, the constables in Aurelia wouldn't, wouldn't venture eight miles out of town to arrest, especially Sandy McDuff. But in this, in this case, uh, Constable Thomas Moffat um, was quite happy to head back to the bar with him. And the reason being, before Dara had left the tavern, he whispered to Livingston, his, the young bartender, his son-in-law, he said, serve Sandy all the whiskey he wants. Um, get him focused on drinking and not on, on uh, breaking up the bar. And that he, he would come back with help. So at eight o'clock at night, um, he, he arrives back there with just one constable and he talks to the young bartender. The bartender says, yes, it worked. Sandy drank himself into a stupor. He stumbled up the stairs to find a bed. And so when they walked upstairs into the, the first room at the top of the stairs, they were Sandy snoring on the bed and it was no trouble to get handcuffs on him and to, to uh, roast him out onto his horse and, and off to jail. So in, in May of 1877, Sandy is arrested um, for attempted murder. Um, they brought out um, an old warrant for um, aggravated assault that he had done a year before. Um, he was put on trial in Barrie at the courthouse in Barrie. Um, no, I take that back, that happened later. He got out on bail. Um, his father and his and his older brother showed up at, at the Barry at his arraignment and paid bail. They didn't say how much it was, but bail typically was was like a year's salary for a working man, like five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, which is a huge amount of money. So his father put this money up, this farmer, and then Sandy skipped bail and disappeared for a year. Um, so his father lost the money. Sandy had to head off to Michigan. He, he hung out in the lumber camps in, in Michigan for a full year. And during that year, surprise, surprise, the uh, spree of robberies in North Simcoe County abated while he was gone. The Black Swamp Gang, without their leader, shied away from, from all their activities. But a year later, so in, um, um, in the fall of 1878, Sandy McDuff returns to town. And what's the first thing he does? He burns down Dara's tavern, the retribution for having Sandy arrested in his tavern. Um, County Constable Rogers got wind that Sandy was back in town. And at the first clue as to where he was, he, was, he sent six constables from the Barry police force to go and arrest him. 
They show up at the farm where Sandy was hiding out and Sandy fights back. He beats three of those constables into helplessness and he chases the other three away, yelling at them, I'm afraid to hit you because I'm afraid I'll kill you. Um, they grab their, their, their struggling uh, cohorts and, and drag their tails back down to Constable Rogers. Rogers was furious with them. How can six men not be able to arrest one man? Um, he said, the next clue I get, I'll arrest them myself or I'll eat my badge. And it was only a week later when, uh, when word came that Sandy was going to be at a barn raising in Coldwater. So Rogers takes two men with him, and the three of them were intent on bringing Sandy McDuff back to jail. He takes two men he knows he can trust. One was his 22-year-old son, who would go on to be the next county constable, um, and the biggest, strongest policeman in Barrie, Tom Shannon. So the three men head out head out to this barn raising dance going on out in cold water. They scout around, they get the lay of the land. Um, Rogers was a major in the Simcoe County Forters, Foresters Militia. Um, he knew tactics. So they scattered out, they make a plan of attack, they get organized. And then Rogers steps in the front door with two guns in his hands, using his major's voice, uh, commands the music to stop. Uh, tells everyone to get back against the wall. So he's holding his guns on them to control the crowd. And then the two other constables race in the back door and tackle Sandy McDuff, who was up playing the fiddle at the other end of the hall. A heroic fight goes on between the three men. Sandy gets the best of them, but Shannon was able to get around him, get a bear hug all, all on Sandy, folded him over like a jackknife is what they said in the, in the paper. And uh, at that point, uh, Rogers Jr. was able to get handcuffs on him. As they dragged him across the dance floor and out to their wagon, they were spit on by the crowd. Two men tried to rush them and free Sandy. One ran into uh, um, Constable Rogers' gun and was knocked silly by the butt of the gun. The other one, they had to shoot into the floor and, and uh, in front of the man as he was rushing forward and set everybody back on their heels. But they took Sandy McDuff, they dragged him out to the wagon and back to jail in Barrie. He spent three months in jail waiting for his court, his trial. And the judge at the trial first um, heard evidence on the charge of aggravated assault on another barkeeper a year earlier. And he convicted him of aggravated assault on, on, um, on uh, Jeremiah Orser. And immediately sentences him to one year in the Toronto Central Prison. And at that point, he just threw out the two attempted murder charges against the Daras and said, one year in jail will be good enough. And so for one year, Sandy McDuff's off to jail. In the month and a half or so that he was back in town and out on, um, or after coming back from Michigan, robberies around Simcoe County had taken off again. Now that he's back in jail for a year, um, the robbery stopped once again. But when he came back in, in October of 1879, when he reappears in town, um, not only did the robbery start up again, but it was at, at twice the rate before. And this time, um, Sandy focused entirely on horses, on, on the, uh, the high value robberies. He found during those few months that he was back, that he was stealing so many horses, they weren't able to sell them anymore. And so he came up with a new plan. They'd steal the horses, they'd take them to an out of the way railway crossing um, out in the country. Um, the train would stop, they'd load the horses onto a train, the horses would be shipped off to the, the uh, big stock sales in Toronto or Hamilton or Waterloo. One report says he sh would ship the horses as far as way as uh, Chicago to sell them. Um, and this way they could sell the horses without um, any suspicion um, in trying to sell them locally. This went on for three months and the farmers were all up in arms because they were all losing their horses. And they weren't just from the farms, they were stealing horses from the back of businesses in Aurelia. They were stealing horses from people's stables in their backyards in Aurelia. Wherever they had access, um, they, were, they were taking these horses. But it only lasted for a few months because in January, uh, Sandy being Sandy, he got into an alter altercation in a bar. 
he beat this alcoholic severely to the point where people were appalled. The people in the ball bar were appalled at the beating he put on this guy, kicking him in the head after he was down. Um, the, the, the constables had no choice but to arrest him. And he'll hauled back down to court and the judge um, sentenced him very leniently because the Black Swamp Gang, um, the day before the trial, got a hold of, of the poor alcoholic and said, you know, if you tone down your story and say it wasn't very bad, uh, we'll reward you. And he did. And his testimony contradicted all the other eyewitnesses. He's saying, oh, it wasn't that bad. It was just a, it was just a little scuffle in the bar. And for that reason, Sandy got off easily. He got sent back to the Toronto prison for just four months. It could have been years and years for, for a, second, uh, um, a second conviction. So Sandy went to jail between January and May of 1880. In February of 1880, the second month he was in jail, there was a very significant event that affects our story. And you may have heard of the Black Donnellys, the Black Donnelly murders in outside London, Ontario. This was a, 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 a family, a clan of men who were just troublemakers in the area. They were all kinds of crime was blamed on them, but they could never con get convictions of them. Finally, after a barn was burned, um, the local farmers had had enough and they formed a vigilante. Um, and at one o'clock in the morning, they storm in the Donnelly's house. They brutally murder four of them. One was stabbed with a pitchfork. Then they went down the road to the oldest son's house and shot him at his doorstep at two o'clock in the morning and, uh, and then it escaped. There was an eyewitness to it who testified at the trial of the ringleader. But in spite of that, the ringleader was acquitted of murder because public opinion was so fervently against the Donnellys that they just, they just um, couldn't get a fair trial. And uh, the ringleader got off uh, with an acquittal. It was famous across Canada. It was reported in the papers across the States and even in England. It was a terribly uh, sensational case that was reported for weeks um, in the papers. And the farmers in North Simcoe County took note that this family who was causing no end of trouble was only finally dealt with by vigilante justice. And the vigilantes got away with murder. When Sandy McDuff got out of jail in May of 1880, um, they ramped up the horse stealing again. And it was at this point that the oral farmers finally started to clue in that this isn't just random, this is organized, this is a group of men. And they started to recognize that the tactics that were going on, the terrorism, the threats, the barn burnings, the intimidations, it's the same kind of thing that Sandy McDuff and his boys did when they were beating up people in the bars. And they started putting two and two together um, and uh, suspected Sandy McDuff and all those young men who hung out with them were behind these robberies somehow. They still had no idea how their horses disappeared or where they went because they just poofed into midair and were gone. Um, in August of 1880, the farmers were finally have, were having enough. It had been two months of, of crazy robbery all across the area. There was a robbery of a, uh, a pair of horses and a buggy outside Barrie. The, the, uh, um, the farmer was able to follow the trail of the horses on the dirt road, and he followed it up, up um, Barrie to Dalston, from Dalston to Rugby, and from Rugby North into the Black Swamp. And he ventured into the Black Swamp by himself and came across a boy who told him, oh, yeah, there's a wagon in that clearing over there that, that uh, everyone's looking for because it was stolen on Friday night. This was on Sunday. Um, so he goes over and he follows the trail of that wagon to a farm. And at that farm, there had been a robbery the night before on the Saturday night. Um, at this point, he figures, OK, two stolen stolen wagons have gone into this into the black swamp this must be this must be a transition area or something so he goes back to barry he gets two constables on their way back to the black swamp they get a, a band of farmers together so there's you know 15 or 20 men storming into the black swamp going down the trails and they actually came across the guy who had stolen it. He was asleep on a pile of buff buffalo roads in that clearing in the Black Swamp. 
and they arrest him. He refuses to, to name who his two cohorts were. He refuses to admit that he was part of the Black Swamp Gang. They, they arrest him anyway. He ends up getting convicted and goes to jail for three years for, for this robbery. But that was the first identification of the Black Swamp as being the headquarters for the Black Swamp Gang. Just two weeks later, another Oro farm um, was robbed and uh, the farmer got a band of farmers together into a vigilante and they were out to get the Black Swamp Gang. They, they went to the crest of the hill overlooking the Black Swamp. They saw a campfire. They knew that was their, their goal and they started heading down into the trails. It's hard to find out where you're going in the trails. Um, but uh, they get down near the campfire and don't they run across two men on horses coming out, two Black Swamp Gang members. The men wheel their horses around and take off. The farmers on their horses take off after them. And there's this wild chase um, through the, the warren of trails through the Black Swamp. Whenever they got close enough, they'd fire shots at them. But the men got away. And when, by the time they got to the clearing where the fire was, the fire had been put out and there was nothing there. Um, but again, they confronted the Black Swamp gang in their, in their home territory. Just a week after that, another farmer um, near Rugby, uh, Lidster, um, caught three Black Swamp men um, racing out of his barn. He saved his horses, but uh, he chased the men off. In the morning, he went to Aurelia. He got Constable Moffat and Shannon, or, um, got two constables, and they... Uh, they get a posse of farmers together and they head up into the Black Swamp. These guys, they just did a methodical search on every trail right through the Black Swamp. They spent the whole day doing it and never found anybody. But that was in the course of four weeks, there were three vigilante uh, posses of farmers who were hunting through the Black Swamp trying to get, trying to get the Black Swamp gang. At this point, Sandy McDuff and his boys realized that it's getting a little hot around here. There was an article in the paper that concluded that maybe it's time for a good lynching. And you start reading that in the paper and everybody suspects you already and the farmers are already vigilantes. It's time to calm things down. And over the winter of 1880, Sandy McDuff lays low a little bit. He's still around town. He's still brawling in the bars, but the, the robberies subside. But in the summer of 1881, they're back at it again. Realizing that Oro was a scary place to go with the vigilantes out there, they, they shift their focus. And now all the robberies were going on in Midland to the point where the papers in Aurelia were commenting on how many robberies there are over in Midland. Um, when Dr. Spawn, the medical doctor, had his, his pair of horses and his buggy stolen, he reports it to the local constables. Um, the next night, a local farmer on the outskirts of town reports that his wagon and horses were stolen. Um, the two constables were able to identify the trail of that second wagon. So on a Sunday morning, they start out following this trail. The trail goes south from, Mudland, from Midland through Stainer, around Orr Lake, around Hillsdale, up around the north side of the Black Swamp, and at Colson, it heads into the Black Swamp. So they're pretty confident they're on the trail of the Black Swamp Gang. By the time they got to Colson, they had rounded up um, a pretty sizable band of farmers who were, who were determined to help them get these guys. It had been the driest summer in years. Water was really low, wells were drying up, the Black Swamp had dried out, the trails were very passable. The constables felt that if they were fast enough, they could catch the, the uh, thieves by surprise. And so they head into the Black Swamp at a gallop um, on trails that normally would be was soggy and marshy. Now they're hard and firm. And so they're going pretty fast through here. The, the men with the stolen wagons and horses can hear them coming. They had barely enough time to hop on those horses and head out the trail on the other side of the clearing just seconds ahead of the posse. The posse sees them and the chase is on. They're racing like crazy around the warren of trails. They can't, the Black Swamp men can't shake the, the posse behind them. Finally, realizing that they're not going to escape dragging these wagons behind them, they jump out of the wagons, leave the horses and escape on foot into a thicket where horses couldn't follow them. The posse comes up, 
um, takes possession of the horses, but decide they're never going to be able to catch them on foot going through that thick, thick bush, not knowing where they were. And they let the black swamp men get away. But it's one of the few instances where the horses were actually recovered. Dr. Spawn got his horses back. But that was the fourth posse that had gone into the, the black swamp chasing him down. So clearly, Oro was, was too hot an area to, to continue with crime. It looks like Midland was too hot an area. So the next week, Sandy shifts focus to North Aurelia, out towards Utah. And there's this rash of, of robberies out in, in uh, North Aurelia Township. But the farmers were saved a, a couple of weeks later in the 1st of September. And again, this being the hottest, driest summer, it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit and grass fires started. And all over Simcoe County, grass fires were starting to, to uh, blaze up. The farmers were out there harvesting their grain as fast as they could before it burned. Um, wells were dry. They were having to drag water um, eight, eight kilometers um, to feed their cattle. Um, the Black Swamp Gang, who were causing all these, or carrying out all these robberies, they realized that we have to get home to protect our own farms because they're mostly farmers. And the robbery stopped because of the grass fires. Um, during this whole episode with the, the robberies in, in North Aurelia and the grass fires going on, there was an article in the Toronto Globe newspaper um, that was of great interest to a lot of people. It was a very sensational report of the Black Swamp Gang and their antics. So it described the gang, it described Sandy McDuff by name, it described how they, how they robbed, how they, how they got rid of the stolen merchandise and the stolen horses, um, and it called for, for justice um, um, for the Black Swamp Gang. This was very sensational, and Sandy McDuff could not have missed this and at this point, there was already one article in the paper calling for a lynching. There had been four vigilantes chasing them after the whole success of the Black Donnelly vigilantes. And in the fall of 1881, um, Sandy McDuff decided it was too dangerous to hang around. He disbanded his gang and he hightailed it off to his sisters up in, uh, in Bruce County, um, up on the Bruce Peninsula. Uh, he, he and his sister Rosa, who was another Black Swamp Gang member, they spent two years living with their sister Bella and uh, just doing day labor up in that area. And Sandy wasn't heard, heard of again um, for about two years. And in 1884, um, big things were happening in Aurelia. Um, that was the summer, if you've read my previous book on booze, 1884 was the year they had a plebiscite about outlawing alcohol in Simcoe County. And, and that November, um, alcohol became illegal to sell. Well, that was an opportunity for someone like Sandy McDuff. One of his better friends in Aurelia was the, uh, the brewmaster of the local brewery. And uh, Sandy McDuff in 1884 reappeared in town um, he started gathering his gang together and doing some petty thievery, but that only lasted for about a month because in November, he got into moonshining. With alcohol being illegal, there was a huge market now for bootlegging and moonshining. And so his friend, the brewer, set up this big still out in the Black Swamp. And Sandy, it looks like, was the, the man who was going to sell the booze for him. He would set up the blind pigs and the illegal, the illegal drinking holes because he had the, the contacts and, and, and uh, the connections to be able to do that. But that only lasted about two or three months before they still got shut down and Sandy McDuff disappeared again. There's still warrants out for his arrest, so he couldn't afford to get caught. We don't hear from Sandy McDuff again until 1888, four years later. And in, in that year, down near Windsor, just outside Windsor, there was a robbery murder. And uh, two men were, were arrested and put on trial. One of them was convicted and sent to prison. But during the trial, they said, we were there, but we weren't in charge. There was a third party who planned the whole thing, recruited us, and he's the one who actually fired the gun that killed the old man. And his name is Sandy McDuff. Um, and descriptions of Sandy McDuff uh, absolutely matched the Sandy McDuff from Simcoe County. So by the time the county 
or the provincial detectives got down there and started hunting around, Sandy McDuff was long gone. Um, he had hopped on a, on a lake freighter, uh, shipped over to Detroit, jumped ship there and headed up back up into Michigan into the lumber camps where you can be anonymous. And again, we don't hear from him again for six years. And in 1894, up in Michigan in the lumber camps, there's a, another robbery murder. A man was murdered by his partner um, and had $800 stolen. Um, they never caught the person who did it, but they, they gathered the evidence. And it turns out the man living under an alias was actually Sandy McDuff. And he was tried and convicted in absentia um, of murder of this, of this uh, lumberman. At this point, the province of Ontario put out an $8,000 reward for the capture of Sandy McDuff. So now he's got a, he's got a price on his head. And $8,000 is like 10 or 12 years salary for a working man in a sawmill. Like this is a significant reward. So you know there's going to be bounty hunters on the lookout for him. So Sandy McDuff just dis disappears again. There's a report of him reappearing at his sister Eliza's house in Winnipeg at one point, but then he melted away. And finally, he was identified one more time in 1905. This is this is 20 years after he left Aurelia. Um, uh, he was identified outside Windsor again and absolutely identified. But by the time the provincial detectives got there, he had disappeared again. And no one knows exactly what happened to Sandy McDuff. When he had left Aurelia in 1882, at least two of the Black Swamp members fled town too. Uh, you know, Connor went to, went to the mission lumber camps and uh, one other of the Black Swamp gangs uh, headed up to Huntsville and worked in the lumber camps up there. The gang really broke up in 1882. But no one knows what happened to, to Sandy McDuff, the leader. One rumor said that uh, he died in a bar fight in Mexico. Another one said that he came back to Barrie and in a lumber camp outside Barrie, he, he was shot to death. Um, nobody, nobody really knows. Um, but Sandy McDuff, by this time, by 1905, had taken on a, a, a bit of a romantic legend. Uh, he was thought on the way we would think of uh, Bonnie and Clyde or uh, Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, where the daredevilry and the fun they had eclipsed the terror and the lives they ruined. Um, people were living in you know, the stories of the 10 cent dime novels uh, of the Wild West of, of, uh, um, of uh, Kit Carson and stories like that where people were idealized and romanticized. And that's how Sandy was thought of, even though he had ruined people's lives. Um, um, that's not how he was remembered. By the 1920s though, by the time the people who had been living in the area when the Black Swamp Gang was, was busy, by the time those people had died off, the memory of the Black Swamp Gang and Sandy McDuff died with them. Um, in my research, I didn't come across a single person who knew who Sandy McDuff or the Black Swamp Gang was. They're completely lost to history. But in around 1900, they were very famous. Um, and there were two, um, two outcomes of, of the antics of Black Swamp Gang that uh, sort of changed Ontario a little bit. One was the advent of Prohibition. Prohibition and the temperance workers um, gained traction because of the violence and the brawling that went on in Aurelia um, and, and towns like Aurelia. And if it hadn't been for, for gangs like the Black Swamp Gang, who caused so much havoc and so much violence around town, um, the temperance movement may not have, have moved along as quickly as it did. Um, Aurelia finally outlawed the sale of alcohol in 1908, and Aurelia was a dry town from 1908 to 1950. 41 years of no alcohol in Aurelia. And the Black Swamp Gang has a little bit of the causation of that. Another thing that, that resulted from the Black Swamp Gang more specifically was the creation of the OPP. So in the 1870s and 80s, you had the town constables who were busy in their towns and you had the county constables who were inept in what they were doing because they had no funding to do what they had to do. Um, the province created the position of the provincial detective um, who was responsible to assist the county constables in the investigation of major crime. So the first one was in 1877, 
They named a second one in 1884. That was Joe Rogers Jr. And the third one was in 1892. So in the 1890s, there was only three detectives investigating all the crime in rural Ontario. It was a, a, a hopeless task. By, by the 1900s, they realized that uh, something else had to be done. And in 1909, the province created the Ontario Provincial Police, the police force specifically to patrol rural areas. Unfortunately, the OPP was terribly underfunded in the early years through, through World War I. It wasn't until 1929, I think it was, when they finally legislated a big enough budget that the OPP could actually do their job very effectively. But the lobbyist to create the OPP was Joseph Rogers Jr. Joseph Rogers Jr. became the first commissioner of the OPP. Joseph Rogers Jr. was the man who arrested Sandy McDuff at the barn raising in Coldwater. Um, he had been in bar fights with Sandy McDuff. He'd, Sandy McDuff had thrown him over a, rail, or a, a, a stairway railing in a brawl in a, in a Aurelia bar. It was his experience with the Black Swamp Gang that got Joseph Rogers Jr. Um, motivated to lobby for the creation of the OPP. So that's just an interesting side note that uh, um, evolved from the antics of the Black Swamp Gang. But that's the story. That's, it's, it's, it was hard to piece this all together, um, but it's, it, it's a significant story of, of life in, in uh, Simcoe County way back in the day when Aurelia was going through its, its wild times. So I'm going to stop there. There's there's tons more information and details and, and specifics in, in my book. This is a, a, an overview, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I can talk about this all day. So I'll, I'll send it back to Lindsay and she can field any questions you have. That's great. Thank you so much, Steve. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and we actually at OMA, we run a tour in the summertime, a walking tour called Gangs, Guns and Grog, True Stories of Aurelia's Wild West Days. And you put me onto the Black Swamp Gang. So you you influenced that part of the tour. And um, they are just so much fun to talk about. So thank you for sharing all your stories with us. Um, I, I have to. I have to thank Larry Cotton and all the research he did in his book in Whiskey and Wickedness, because I relied on that a lot, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great one as well. Yeah. Um, so while folks type their questions into the Q&A, um, I'm going to start us off just, just while people type. So, um, Dave, one thing I'm wondering is when does the name Black Swamp Gang first appear? Is it in that sensational article you talked about? Um, yeah, that, that's, the, that's the first naming of the gang I heard. I'm pretty sure they were talking about it in 1879 when he, when he got out of jail after his second stint in jail and the, the crime really took off. Um, it, was, it was just after that that they, they tracked him to the Black Swamp Gang. And that, so it was late in 1879 or 1880, I think is when, when the names started being labeled. Okay, fascinating. Um, so the first question that we've got here from Alan is are there any verified descendants of Sandy McDuff in Simcoe County? That was my question too. Yeah. Sandy McDuff never got married, has no children that we know of. Um, his older brother, John, who was the barroom brawler, uh, when I check ancestry.com, it doesn't look like he had any descendants, but his older brother, Archie, the oldest brother, um, I did come across, um, um, in around 1910, he had two sons who were still doing uh, work on the roads in Simcoe County. So if there are McDuffs around, I apologize if you're out there listening, I never contacted you, but um, if there are McDuffs around, they're probably descendants of his oldest brother, Archie. Um, his, needless to say, his sisters all took on other names and at least two of them moved far away. So I don't know about, about the other two. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, there's a two-part question here from DM, our friend at Rogers, um, who says, firstly, does the Black Swamp still exist? And if yes, do you know if anyone has gone searching for artifacts that may have been left behind? <laughs> yeah, me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, I've driven out there several times doing it. So it's interesting. You, you drive down Horseshoe Valley Road, 
and you turn on the seventh and you drive up and you'll come to Mill, is it Mill Road, Mill Pond Road or something like that. So it's a left turn and boom, you'll come across um, a pond that obviously is backed up by a dam that's underneath the road. And that's obviously the dam at Colson. And it's a, it's a nice little area now because it, it's all been drained away. It, there's very little swamp left. It's just real lowland. Um, but that's obviously where, where the little community of Colson was. But then you continue on and you turn, you over to the sixth and you turn right and you drive three or four kilometers down there and you turn on the next concession road. There's a little low land with a creek going through there, a really pretty little valley, but huge, no trespassing signs. Like they're really serious, but they're no trespassing signs. I look up the driveway and there's this huge house up in there. I hope this person's not listening. But anyway, <laughs> you stand on the road from the bridge and you look in and you can see a great big concrete dam in there. And the story of that dam is in my book. That's a dam that washed out and washed out the dam below it and drowned the, the miller and the, the dam below it. So you can still find the remnants of those dams, those, those uh, three dams that were up there. But as far as the swamp goes, when I drove around, it's not swampy, it's just scrubby lowland, you know, pine bush and things like that. A lot of houses have been built. It looks like there's been a lot of fill has been dumped in there to build the houses. So it's hard to identify the swamp. I identified the swamp by going on the Simcoe County maps and you can click on all kinds of things. And I clicked on landforms and boom, this area, that, that uh, diamond shaped area just jumps out at you. It's the only place in Ontario with that silt pattern um, that clearly was a swamp. And so that, that's why I called that the swamp, but it's, it's absolutely the location. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. We have a question here from Wesley. Is there a list of the people who suffered at the hands of the Black Swamp Gang? <laughs> no. The newspapers of the day, the newspaper editors, refused to sensationalize this. They didn't report, you probably found in your research, they don't report on very many of the brawls that happened. They didn't want to sensationalize, they didn't want to encourage it. So, and when they mention the brawls, it's just like two lines. There was a brawl and they don't tell you anything about it. Likewise, they don't tell you the victims. And so there's very few times when you can find the names of the victims, mostly because the farmers were afraid to report it because barn burnings were incredibly common and, and you couldn't afford to have your barn burned down. Like these, you know, these weren't wealthy farms so you couldn't replace a, a barn very easily. So most of this crime went unreported. Um, when they created the OPP, one of the things they said was how underreported crime was in the rural areas. We didn't feel we needed more than the provincial detectives because crime was so rare there until they started organizing in their reports and realizing, holy cow, there's crime everywhere. It's, it's rampant. And uh, it, was, it was more of a, an urban legend that there was no crime in the rural areas because they're all communal farmers supporting each other. Well, no, there's tons of crime. And that's why the OPV was created. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I have very few names other than the few that are in the book. Um, you know, Dr. Spahn and, and, uh, and what, Lidster and uh, Kundles was another one, but uh, there's not a lot of names. Okay. Um, we have a question here from John who says, Ontario has a history of the religious gang fights between Catholics and Protestants during the late 1800s. You mentioned the Regans, but were there more in Simcoe County? The McIntosh boys from Beaverton were, I think, I think they were Scottish, but I'm not sure, but they came in and for one summer, they were causing all kinds of trouble. There were gangs right in Aurelia. There was one, uh, uh, John, John McDuff, Sandy's older brother and three of the Black Swampers had this uh, awful, terrible fight. And they said it was against a gang of, of five like-minded like men from Aurelia. So there were, you know, groups of men right in Aurelia. Um, there's, there's all kinds of reports. I, I read uh, the PhD thesis on rural crime. Um, and this, this academic was saying that crime sprang up sporadically across Southern Ontario when a leader came to the fore, someone like Sandy McDuff that people rallied around and who took the men in that direction. So, you know, it's, you could be you know, follow someone and to be a religious and you'd, be, and you'd have this religious outbreak or you could get behind a criminal and there'd be a criminal outbreak. I, in my book, I, I, I give examples of three or four other gangs that developed 
um, the, the very famous Dufferin gang just five years after Sandy McDuff left and, oh, sorry, um, that was 10, or 10 years after McDuff and they got into um, insurance fraud burning down barns. And that's a fascinating story. Um, they, they take out huge insurance policies on all this stuff inside their barn and then they clean out the barn, burn it down and go to the insurance company and make claims on all the cattle and barn and, and wagons and everything else they had in the barn. And they'd shift it to another barn and six months later, burn that one down. <laughs> and this went on and on and on. And it was just these, these two guys, the Ballards, who, uh, who came up with the scheme. And, and there are others. There are other, I, I got two more in the book, just small time gangs in Barrie who were doing the same kind of thing. So it all came down to, to the leader someone who could rally men and get them organized and then what direction you take them. Wow. Um, so we're gonna wrap it up here. There's a couple of comments I saw that I wanna point out. Valerie says, this would make a great play. <laughs> and I agree. <laughs> I can see um, the fight scenes. <laughs> great fight scenes. <laughs> and, um, Julia has a cool comment here. She says, on another note, my great great grandfather and his son were involved as character witnesses of the ringleader of the Donnelly vigilante gang. Wow. So, really cool. Yeah, there's books that have been written about that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so uh, wonderful comments here. Just a ton of thank yous for you, Dave. So, I'm glad um, people enjoy it. Yeah, I I think I speak for all of us when I say it was wonderful. So thank you. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Trish now to wrap everything up for us. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all out here tonight. Um, thanks for joining us as we kick off our 2023 series uh, with Dave's presentation on the Black Swap Gang. You know, Dave never disappoints. His knowledge and passion for our local history is amazing. So thank you, Dave, so much for once agreeing to be our yearly kickoff speaker for our series and sharing us with a very interesting and shocking time of our local history from about 150 years ago. And I also wanna say thank you for donating a signed copy of your book, which will be, uh, there'll be a draw uh, very shortly. Uh, so thanks for doing that as well. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone uh, joining us this evening. Your continued support and interest in our community's local history is appreciated. Uh, the History Committee has been be pre in, uh, busy preparing a complete roster of excellent speakers for 2023. A lot of informative presentations are coming your way. So the first one we have coming up is Black History Month. We welcome Paul Barber as guest speaker on February 15th, who will present his topic from Virginia to Canada, the journey of my Black ancestors. Um, so while breaking down his ancestral brick wall, which had him stumped for many years, uh, Paul, a Caucasian born and raised Canadian, found out through his maternal side, the Hendersons, that he was part of the African-American history. So join us to hear Paul recount the family journey that led him to Aurelia, where the Hendersons, who made their way to Canada in 1840, played a contributing role in the history of our community. And then on March 15th, local historian, author Dennis Rizzo will be presenting the family legacy, building on your own family stories. So join Dennis, who has written some books as A Brief History of Aurelia and co-editor of the Mariposa Exposed, provides insights into how you too can research and build on your own family's fascinating and diverse stories, whether it be stories from your grandparents, your aunts and uncles, or some fireside chats you heard about some days ago. All these become part of your own legacy. And so how do you collect these? How do you preserve them? So J Dennis is gonna share his expertise with us that evening to how you can create your own family legacy. So we hope you can come join us and uh, learn some more on how you can do that. Right. Thank you Dave, again for your amazing presentation. That was wonderful. Thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next month for the next installment of the History Speaker Series. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs>